welcome attendees. Welcome to SAMPI. Thank you for joining, especially our early folks. Uh, thank you for joining the SAMPI Techno Technical Committee webinar series. Keep joining folks. Folks, I am gonna ask you one thing. In the chat, please enter in your name, your organization name, and where you are geographically based. So welcome again to SAMPI's Technical Committee webinar. As I mentioned, please add in the chat your name, your organization, and where you are geographically located. We're going to start sharply in a few minutes, but thank you for those folks who've joined earlier. I see a lot of our friends out there. Joe Fox, thank you. Mike Mayer, wonderful. Ted Lynch. We expect a really large turnout today, so we're really uh, happy for that. But as I mentioned in the chat, please put in your name, your company organization, and where you are geographically. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, welcome from Brazil. Thank you for joining. Thank you, folks. Welcome to SAMPI's first technical committee webinar series. We will be starting shortly. We have a wonderful global group on today. Thank you, folks from uh, John. Say Susan. Thank you, Susan, from France, Japan. Simon from uh, University of Sherbrooke in Quebec. Thank you. Again, welcome to the SAMPI Technical Committee's first webinar. Right here from our own country, San Diego, Montreal, Maud. Thank you. Keep joining, folks. Thank you, Jeff. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the SAMPI Technical Committee's webinar series. Today's our first one. Thank you, David. Keep entering in your name, your organization name, and where you're located geographically. We certainly do have a global presence. SAMPI is a global organization. So thank you to our folks from Lockheed Martin in California. Annalisa, thank you for joining. We will be starting very shortly, I believe I'm going to start now. Good morning, colleagues. We'd like to learn more about you. So as I asked, please enter your name, company, and geographic location in the chat. My name is Raj Manchanda, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer of SAMPI North America. And Ms. Rocio Figueroa on my team is managing this presentation. On behalf of our CEO, Ms. Rebecca Stacha, our current president, Scott Stevenson, and incoming president, Sarah Cox, and the other members of the executive cabinet, we welcome you to the SAMPI Technical Committee's first webinar on thermoplastic composite repair, evolution, research, and opportunities. SAMPI currently offers seven technical committees, and we invite you to join a technical committee of your interest. The TCs provide year-long education and networking opportunities for experts, early career professionals, and graduate students. They're a great way to start getting more involved with SAMPI in addition to our chapters. The technical committees typically meet virtually for approximately one hour each month and twice a year in person at SAMPI Spring Conference, which next will be May 20th to 23rd, 2024 in Long Beach, and CAMEX, which is upcoming in October 30th to November 2nd in Atlanta. You can join a technical committee of your choice on SAMPI's 365 community platform. The technical committees are open to members and non-members. The TCs provide year-long education and networking opportunities for experts, early career professionals, and graduate students. This week, SAMPI released the State of the Technology Industry Report, which was developed by the technical committees. You can download your complimentary copy from the SAMPI online store on nasampi.org. That's nasampi.org. Composites World will also be announcing SAMPI's State of the Technology Industry Report shortly to its audience. Technical committees are open to global participants from industry, academia, and government and offer a convenient platform for all to learn, network, and discuss trends and collaborate on the development of industry solutions year-round. Again, please join a technical committee of your choice and contribute to a future SAMPI SOTAR. That's the State of the Technology Industry Report. If you'd like to know more about the report, there's a press release from our marketing director, Ms. Chris Locke, available. The SAMPI sales team has developed special custom sponsorship opportunities for future TC webinars. So if your company is interested in learning more, please contact my colleague, Mr. Jordan Stewart. I will put his email in the chat. 
It's J-O-U-R-D-A-N at Sampi.org. J-O-U-R-D-A-N at Sampi.org. Now I'll introduce Sampi Fellow, Mr. David Leach of ATC Manufacturing. David was promoted to the prestigious Sampi Fellow grade from Sampi member a few years ago and is a longtime Sampi contributor. He currently serves as chair of Sampi TC6, which is the Thermoplastics Technical Committee that sponsored today's webinar. David would serve as moderator today. Thank you, David. Right, welcome. Uh, thanks, Raj, and welcome to everyone for the uh, to the first of the uh, Sampi webinar summer series here. Um, there's obviously a lot of interest in thermoplastics right now for a range of applications and industries, and an important aspect is repair of thermoplastic components. So that's what we've uh, chosen as the topic for the first webinar. Um, today we have the two presentations, as you saw. First will be Julieta Barreta Robles from the National Research Council of Canada, based in Montreal, Canada. And then that'll be followed by Arne Offringer from GKN Aerospace in the Netherlands. Um, each presentation will run for around 25 minutes, uh, leaving some time for kind of questions and discussion. Uh, we'll handle all the questions at the end of the second presentation, so it'll give you a chance to see both presentations first before we go into the uh, Q&A and discussion. Now, please make sure if you do have questions, you put those into the Q&A tab. Uh, that's normally at the bottom of the screen uh, in the webinar tools, uh, so put the, the questions in the Q&A tab, not in the chat tab. Uh, we'll certainly try and get to all the questions, and the presenters and the SAMPI team can stay on a little beyond the scheduled hour, probably about another 10 minutes or so beyond. Uh, also, so you know, the webinar will be recorded uh, and will be made available at a later date, although the presentations will, will not be made available at this time. Uh, so first of all, uh, over to uh, Julieta for the first of our uh, two presentations today. Thank you, David. So I'm going to be sharing my screen. Um, okay, so can you see my screen? Uh, yep, Good. we see it fine. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So I'll get started. So thank you so much for the uh, introduction. So as uh, David and Raj said, so I'm Julieta Barreta Robles from uh, the National Research Council in Canada, located in Montreal, Quebec and I'm a research officer. Um, so to start my presentation, uh, well, we know that composite materials with thermoset matrices such as epoxies have been used in aerospace for quite some time. And one example of this is the Airbus A350, as it can be seen in the slide. So it is inevitable that when these aircraft are going to be in service, they're going to encounter damage. So there have been studies that have analyzed over 5,000 damage incidents and what researchers found was that 56% of these damages were dense, with sizes ranging from 0.1 up to 50 millimeters. Other damages that, uh, that were observed were skin deformation, scratch, pull, delaminations, and cracks. That, and the rest of the uh, damages were uh, less than 1.4% uh, of the incidence rate that was observed. So where are these damages located? Over 60% of these damages are located indoors. However, there are other uh, sections in the fuselage, the cone rear, and the wings and nose where these damages are also observed. So these structures get repaired, and there are several benefits. The first one is that it's less expensive to repair rather than replacing, because it represents 8 to 25% uh, of the cost when, when we compare these two key scenarios, and that's without including shipping costs. It is possible to implement temporary solution until we can bring them, the aircraft back into specialized repair station to conduct a major repair. This allows to bring the aircraft back into service sooner, which is out of interest to the airlines. And also, it can lead to a sustainable solution. Instead of having to replace every time, we can repair the component. So now, it's no surprise to us that thermoplastic composites are being used more and more in the industry. And some examples of this include the bracketry of the A350 made out of carbon fiber peak, 
and different parts of the Goldstream G650, which include the floor panels, control surfaces, and the rural elevators made out of carbon fiber PEI, carbon fiber PEC, and carbon fiber PTS. I'm sure Arndt is going to be uh, talking to you uh, more about, about these components. So we know thermoplastic have attracted characteristics and properties. These materials can be melted. They can be remelted to be reformed. So that means we can reprocess these materials and they can be recycled. So they are a sustainable um, choice of material moving forward. In terms of the properties, they have superior fatigue and impact resistance. They have high fracture toughness and also high strength to weight ratios. And the good news is that it's possible to repair these structures. So what can be our strategy? So if we look at composite materials with the Moset matrix, uh, matrices, if, it's, uh, if the damage is on a structural component, typically bolted repairs are applied, which involves uh, using mechanical fasteners to bolt the patch onto the damaged structure. If the damage, on the other hand, is a non-structural component, uh, so if it's cosmetic, typically bonded repairs are applied, which involves preparing the surface, conducting a scarf, and using uh, adhesive bonding to join this patch. However, if the damage is large, typically bonded repairs are applied, as uh, the paper ratios needed would remove uh, a lot of material. So while the strategy uh, for repair of composites with thermosate matrices is clear, the path to repair thermoplastic composite structures is not as clear. So this brings us to our question of how do we repair these materials? So then one strategy that we can take is focusing on this uh, quadrant here as a starting point. So focusing on repairing non-structural components. This one allows us more flexibility to develop a robust process and focusing on parts that can be removed uh, from the aircraft for repair. So for example, we saw that doors uh, encounter or account for over 60% of the damages. We can focus on thin parts that are uh, monolithic structures and uh, focusing on repairing uh, dent uh, type of damages as these are the ones that are observed most in aircraft. So after we have obtained um, a, a robust process from this uh, quadrant, then in the long term, we can develop uh, a method that can be accepted for uh, structural components. So how do we do this? So thermoplastic welding or fusion bonding was initially developed as a method to join or assemble thermoplastic composites. But we can think of repair as uh, joining a patch onto the damaged structure to repair it. So then we can use this uh, method. In thermoplastic welding, we will increase the temperature at the interface in order to soften or melt the material, if it's an amorphous or a semi-crystal material respectively. Then we're going to bring the adherents uh, into intimate contact by applying pressure, at which point interdiffusion of the polymer chains is going to begin in a step called healing. And then once the interface has fully uh, disappeared, then we have attained a fully welded material. The interlaminal bond strength is a function of the three most important parameters in thermoplastic welding, which uh, we know is temperature, pressure, and time. So some examples of uh, technologies that have already been used in aerospace uh, are included in this slide. The first one is resistance welding. In resistance welding, we see a current being passed through a heating or resisting element. And this heating element is typically made out of carbon fiber or stainless steel mesh. Uh, heat is going to be generated via the Joule effect and the adherents to be uh, welded are going to be brought um, into intimate contact by keeping them under pressure. Some examples of uh, parts or structures that have been welded using this technology include the Airbus A350 J nose and the A320 Neo Air intake acoustic panel. The second technology is KVE Induct. Uh, this technology was patented by KVE and follows the, uh, the principle of induction welding, which uh, involves passing an alternating current through a conductive coil, which is going to generate a magnetic field. Eddy currents are induced in the material, which uh, are going to match the high frequency of this magnetic field, 
and then heat will be generated when energy is lost due to the resistance of the material. It is also possible to use susceptors or implants at the interface to concentrate the heat uh, at this region. In the case of KV induct, there's a, key, a heat sink placed uh, between the coil and the part in order to prevent overheating uh, of the operator. Some example uh, uh, structures that have been joined using uh, KV induct include the GC650 rotor and elevators and the A220 fuel tank access panels. And the third technology is conduction welding, which involves using a hot iron to uh, heat at least one of the adherents to be welded. And one uh, part of structure that has been uh, joined using this technology is the A350 fuel tank access columns. So these technologies are being used to uh, join this thermoplastic um, structure so then we can think we can use them for repair. So where are we in terms of the state of the art right now? So I conducted an extensive literature survey on the subject and found that uh, actually the first mention of thermoplastic composite repair dates back to 1980. In that decade, uh, what follows was the theory of crack healing published by Wool. And this was uh, the fundamentals of the research wave that followed, which we can see here. There was a uh, research conducted on how we can repair thermoplastic composites via healing, as well as the challenges of field repair, which were identified. There was a comparison of repair methods, which included mechanical fastening and adhesive bonding, and also resistance uh, induction and ultrasonic welding. Several researchers also focused on amorphous bonding and developed a process that was later uh, be known as the thermabond process. And I'm going to be talking what that process uh, is in the next slide. This first research wave uh, culminated with a demonstration of repair conducted by the uh, US Air Force, Air Force and Northrop Grumman uh, and two review articles on the subject. After this dense uh, period of research on the subject, then all of a sudden we saw uh, there, was, there, there were no new uh, publications or no new work coming out. And this is because right around the mid uh, 90s, tough and epoxies came into the market. So the industry saw a shift from thermoplastics to use these materials. But now what we have seen in the last uh, 10 to 15 years is again, research uh, and interest in the subject as thermoplastics are being used more and more. So we see uh, the explosion of using again ultrasonic and uh, several researchers are focusing on using induction welding for repair. And there was an article published in 2020 and this literature so demonstration, the only demonstration of repair of that uh, first research uh, wave and uh, what researchers have done uh, recently uh, here in Canada, particularly uh, in terms of repair using induction welding. So in the thermobone process, the parent structure was made out of carbon fiber peak and this, uh, the patch was joined using polyether imide, so PEI, as this material is amorphous and compatible with uh, peak. Now, this material can be processed at lower temperatures and the objective was to keep the process window below melt. This would allow them to uh, prevent melting of the parent structure and inducing further damage or uh, other defects such as uh, the laminations. So in this demonstration, uh, we saw a carbon fiber peak damage structure being repaired using resistance welding which meant there was the need for a heating element. Now, this heating element was made out of one layer of carbon fiber peak surrounded by PEI resin film on each side, and the patch was made out of carbon fiber peak with PEI uh, at, the, at the location where it would interface with the heating element. Both the heating element and the carbon fiber peak patch were processed at 380 degrees Celsius, uh, which is the processing temperature of peak. Now, the idea was to pre-process these uh, two components and then provide them to a repair station. The repair was then conducted at a maximum temperature of 330 degrees Celsius for 30 minutes. So this was, uh, this was then possible thanks to the fact that uh, this PEI layer was used uh, together with PEAK. 
Now, in terms of the most recent uh, research that has been conducted, the Code Technology Superior here in Montreal has explored using induction welding to repair uh, specimens made out of carbon fiber PPS. So there were three scenarios that were compared, a baseline, a damaged uh, specimen, which had a hole drilled in the middle, and a repair specimen, which had a patch that was uh, welded using induction welding with a stainless steel mesh. And what uh, researchers found after welding these samples under tension was that this welding process was efficient in repairing samples without any surface preparation. And uh, the specimens saw a recovery of up to 93% when they were repaired compared to the original pencil strength. This research work then led to a second uh, project at the Code Technology Superior, which uh, involved the repair of a thermoplastic carbon fiber peak uh, boom, which is representative of the Canada Arm 2. The Canada Arm 2 is installed in the International Space Station and it's located in low Earth orbit, which makes it prone to impact damage by micro debris. So we can see here what type of damage this micro debris can uh, cause into the structure. As we can see, the entry damage and the back face damage are quite different. And there's uh, extensive damage in the back face actually uh, causing the laminations. So using induction welding, the goal was to uh, explore how these uh, components can be repaired. So similar to the previous project, there was a baseline, a damaged specimen, and a repair specimen. They were repaired using a stainless steel mesh uh, uh, as a susceptor in uh, a continuous uh, mode with the same induction welding setup. And the specimens were tested uh, on their three-point bending, which is the main load case for the Canada Arm II. And the main conclusions was that they were able to uh, produce the delamination seen in the boom um, by high-velocity impact. Then again, the repair was uh, feasible uh, to be conducted without any surface preparation. And this is ideal in this case because sanding would generate dust in space and the repair structure recovered the baseline properties. So now that I have talked to you about the uh, most promising research from the two research uh, waves, let's say, or periods on the subject, then I want to bring back to what the challenges uh, are for using thermoplastic welding for repair. So the first one is temperature control. So how do we attain uh, the temperature control at the interface and prevent uh, deforming or melting the, the, the parent structure and inducing further damage? How do we apply then the consolidation pressures that are required for thermoplastic welding in a repair scenario? Especially because sometimes we might not have access on both sides of the, of the part in order to repair it. This brings me to my third challenge. How do we adapt what we're doing in the lab into a real repair scenario? And finally, there's no uh, simulation tool at the moment that can be used for repair. So now I want to talk to you about what we're doing at NRC to tackle the first and the fourth uh, challenges. So there was some preliminary work conducted uh, based on the thermabond process using resistance welding. And the objective was to evaluate the mechanical performance using uh, both PEI and peak. So using carbon fiber peak substrates and the, the NRC static uh, resistance welding setup, specimens were welded in a single lap shear configuration using stainless steel mesh as the heating element. And there were three configurations that were explored a baseline, which had a peak resin film surrounding the stainless steel, shape, stainless steel um, mesh heating element, sorry. Then uh, one or two layers of PEI on each side of the heating element. And finally, a hybrid heating element, which had both PEI and peak. So to conduct these tests, uh, the first step was to generate lookup tables. So a thermocouple would be placed uh, at the interface and a high temperature would be targeted, which would cover the entire processing range. So in this case, around 400 degrees Celsius. Then we were able to establish a relationship between a temperature and a voltage. So uh, I, I start targeting then uh, temperatures just above the melting temperature of peak and then would break the specimens and target a failure that resemble uh, what we see in the slide cohesive failure which was indicative of uh, having attained uh, a high quality weld. 
The run rate that was used was uh, very, very slow to keep the specimens uh, in contact uh, for longer. So these specimens then, after obtaining this um, failure mode, that temperature was targeted and a set of five specimens was welded and tested using ASTM D1002. So we can see the results in the slide and we see that the baseline, which had peak, uh, peak resin film, at the strengths ranging from 25 to 30 megapascals, which is roughly what we expect with this type of material. But when we compare the case of using a PEI resin film, we saw that we needed to target a temperature above the melt temperature of peak and a significant decrease in the performance. However, what was promising from that work was that using two layers of PEI on each side improved the results, and we were able to reduce the target temperature by 10 degrees. So this results in fair that using this extra layer uh, of, of PEI resin film improved the resin content and also uh, improved the thermal and electrical insulation at the well. And finally, we see that using uh, the uh, hybrid heating element did not uh, yield uh, a high mechanical performance despite of targeting uh, the, the processing temperatures of peak. So from this work, what became evident was that uh, two things. One, that we needed a better understanding of what's happening between the resin film, PEI, and peak, and also that this was quite a bit trial and error. So this led them to conducting a healing study of these two um, dissimilar polymers with the objective of obtaining the welding time. So meaning how long do we need to attain a full well or a degree of healing of one? And this would allow us then to create process maps, which would allow us to relate the temperature and the contact time. So to do so, we used a parallel plate rheometer, as this is a piece of equipment that can be found in most uh, composite processing facilities. And there was a, uh, sorry about that. Okay. There was a um, resin film used uh, at, the, at the bottom, followed by two layers of captain polyimide film. And this captain polyimide film had a hole at the center. Then, on top of it, there was another uh, layer of resin polymer film. Now, this would be to allow contact uh, between the two uh, resin polymer film. There were three configurations being explored again, where uh, PEI, PEI was used on top and bottom, PEI and peak, and then peak, uh, peak. So in terms of the methodology, the specimens were placed in the rheometer and the temperature was increased up to different healing temperatures. Once this healing temperature was obtained, then a, a force of 30 newtons was applied, and this was kept uh, under different, uh, at different contact times. And these contact times range from few seconds up to 20 minutes. Once the desired contact time had elapsed, then the specimens were pulled, and the maximum force that was required to separate those specimens was recorded. Now we have that force, and we know the contact area between. Uh, the polymer films, so then uh, uh, stress was able to be calculated. This was done at each contact time and temperature, and also at the maximum contact time for each temperature. Following the healing theory and the rotation theory, then by normalizing this, this the, by taking the ratio actually of these two numbers, we can obtain a degree of healing and relay them to a contact time and to the welding time. Now, by keeping this in mind, this number here, if we plot it, we can obtain graphs that look similar to what I'm showing you in the slide. Now, by plotting the contact time in the x-axis and the degree of healing in the y-axis, and by taking a linear regression of the points and calculating the slope, we can get the welding times. Now, something that we know from thermoplastic welding, thermoplastic processing is that when we use higher temperatures, then we need less time uh, in order to uh, attain um, a high consolidation. So with this relationship, that means that we can use uh, Arrhenius. And with this relationship, then uh, we were able to generate this uh, process maps for each of the material combinations. So now we can have a better understanding of what's happening and the healing behavior between these materials. 
So what would be the implications for repair then? So for example, if we think of what was done back in uh, the mid-90s with the thermobone process, they uh, did a repair that took 30 minutes. So by taking that time, if we have a big structure and we target 30 minutes, then that means that we need a temperature of at least 370 to obtain a degree of healing of one. So this would most likely melt the parent structure and induce uh, voids and delaminations. So what happens then if we use PEI uh, as intermediate layer and peak? If this layer is not uh, co-consolidated and we keep it in 30 minutes, we would need a temperature just below 350. But then what happens if we co-consolidate this, this uh, layer at pro the processing temperature of peak? So that way we're gonna have uh, at the interface only the PEI being uh, joined at a lower temperature, then we can use the first process map. So that means that we would need a temperature of just above 290, 290 degrees Celsius to obtain a degree of healing of one. Now just know that this uh, the scale of the first uh, process map is different just uh, so you can see the process maps with more clarity. If you want more details on this work, this has been submitted now uh, to Composites Party and hopefully it should be published uh, very soon. So now this brings me back then for our strategy for repair. So keeping it in this quadrant for non-structural repairs, we see that we can generate process maps. And the plan is then to implement these process maps into uh, simulation software and generate a model that captures the behavior and what's happening between the PEI and uh, the peak materials. This could allow us to better temperature control and also to develop then a patch joining operation. So then moving forward, we still have challenges uh, in, in, in the field of thermoplastic composite repair, as we still need to figure out how to control the temperature at the interface and develop these uh, simulation tools. We still need, need to think about how do we scale up what we do in the lab to be applied on the field, and how do we inspect the repair structures? And what does that mean? So if we find defects, what does that mean in terms of the performance? And what are the quality metrics? And this could then lead to a certification of an approved repair method uh, for uh, thermoplastic composites. But of course, with every challenge, then it comes an opportunity or several opportunities in this case. So if we find then a way to repair these materials, we can extend the life cycle of the components, which can lead to a more sustainable solution. Following the trend then of thermoset uh, materials, it would be less expensive to, replay, uh, to repair versus replacement. And this could allow us to return the aircraft back into service sooner. We could also see an even wider application of thermoplastic composites in aerospace and other industries, such as uh, the space industry and UAM, for example. And we can develop models. And also we can use other technologies. So not only thermoplastic welding, but if we bring our expertise together, we can use, for example, a combination of thermoplastic welding, additive manufacturing, AFP, and others. So with that, I would like to thank everyone for your time and attention. And, uh, and I'll happily take any questions at the very end of the webinar. Thank you. Yeah, well, thanks uh, very much, Julieta. Great uh, presentation. Um, as Julieta mentioned, we'll be uh, answering questions at the, the end of both presentations. Uh, but please uh, type your questions in the Q&A tab, uh, not in the chat tab. So we'll be looking in the Q&A tab for the questions. Uh, so our second presentation is from Arn Offringer um, <laughs> of uh, GK and Aerospace in the Netherlands. And uh, thank you, Arn. I know it's uh, late in the day for you, also late in the day for uh, some of our participants here as well. So we appreciate uh, everyone being uh, joining the presentation today. Um, I know it's, uh, it looks like your presentation is, uh, is just oh. coming up right now. Um, yeah. I think it's taken a few moments uh, to load. So uh, maybe uh, aren't, um, well, we're just waiting for the presentation to come up. Uh, I know many people know you, but maybe you could uh, just introduce yourself as well. Yeah, thank you, David. And, and thank you, Raj, also for the invitation. 
um, and Rocio working behind the scenes. Um, yes, I'm uh, director of, the, of what's called the Global Technology Center of Geek and Aerospace in the Netherlands. And uh, Geek and Aerospace has several technology centers worldwide. The one in the Netherlands has a particular focus on thermoplastic composites. And that's an area of technology where I've uh, spent most of my career. So it's an honor to be presenting today. Um, I do hope the presentation is coming up. David, is it is it up there uh, or not? Yep. We yes. got it. Great. Uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing it now. On to, uh, great, right great. Ahead. OK, yeah. so I'm going to skip. You right paid away the to phone the... bill in Netherlands. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or the Thank internet you. bill. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So I'll I'll be so Juliette. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation, and, and it gives a good good overview. I will be giving a bit of the work that has been done in practice, uh, with with real life applications as well. So, uh, can you see the second slide, uh, David? Yes, we can see it. Aren't go ahead. All right. Thank you. So uh, this second slide shows thermoplastic polymers that, um, that are suitable for aerospace structures. So, so we're talking high-end polymers with excellent mechanical properties, even after long-term moisture saturation and, and temperature exposure. So PPS, PEI, PEC, peak, low melt peak, um, those are the polymers we're looking into. And these thermoplastic polymers are of, of particular benefit for aerospace structures because they're very tough. They have very uh, high G1C values. And uh, the picture on this slide shows a tail of a Gulfstream business jet after a severe hill strike event, where the tip of the tail is aluminum, it's dented. The elevator on the left of the picture is actually a thermoplastic composite elevator. It's fairly thin structure, but it has survived in an excellent uh, manner. Um, in thermoplastics, we differentiate between two types of polymers. Uh, first of all, the semi-crystalline polymers, uh, such as PPS, for example, PEC and PEAK, they're widely used. An advantage is excellent uh, resi resistance against aggressive fluids, such as hydraulic fluids or solvents. At the same time, because of this, there are there is limited adhesion properties. And for repair, that's kind of a limitation. Then there are amorphous thermoplastics, such as PEI, uh, also known as a trade name Ultum. Uh, widely used in interiors and floor panels, excellent bonding characteristics, but low chemical resistance. So uh, this slide gives an overview of production parts that uh, are, are performed uh, within my company. So it's, uh, it's, it's panels, interior, exterior, wing products, uh, control surfaces, tails of aircraft in several of these materials. Now, the requirements for repair, basically, as Giulietta already alluded to, is to, to restore the functionality of the product within certification limits. So we're looking for repairs for in-field situations when the aircraft is in use. And also, we want to correct shop floor damages that could occur or faulty manufacturing. And for in-field repairs, it's, it's an advantage if you can use standard and simple equipment and procedures. And so for certain locations, we want to have a flush aerodynamic smooth surface, which is a particular challenge. And we want high durability of these uh, repairs. So a couple of examples, and I have here a table with repair methods, like Julieta also mentioned, there is cosmetic and structural, uh, structural being of relevance to the strength and the function of the part and cosmetic being less relevant for strength of the part. And I have some examples in glass fiber, PEI, carbon PEI, and then there's glass and carbon PPS. So to start with, um, at the left top is floor panels and bulkheads. Um, and there was a need for a quick repair method for this type of product. Now, this is a product of a, of a, a regional aircraft, a Fokker 70, Fokker 100. In the cargo area, the previously thermoset floors were replaced at a certain moment by thermoplastic floors based on the PEI Ultim polymer. So a very well bondable polymer. Um, uh, so the skins used to be uh, uh, phenolic. They had also some issues and then they became thermoplastics. Um, at the same time, the question was, if they are thermoplastic and there is a damage, could you repair this? And the answer was yes. So a kind of a repair kit was developed 
much like a bicycle tire repair kit, very easy to use with instructions. And this repair kit starts with a measurement. So you see there is a, it's a metric measurement, two and a half uh, centimeters, one inch. If the damage or perforation in this, in this panel, in this case, is less than one inch, you're allowed to perform the cosmetic repair. And the way it works is you sand the uh, contour of the repair area, you clean it with alcohol, then you take your patch, which has been uh, pre-manufactured, and it's a tapered patch, so it gives you a, a nice and smooth surface. And as you can see on the pictures, it had several colors, so dark brown, light brown, and whitish color. So there are three layers there of a quarter millimeter each, stepped layers. You apply the Loctite uh, cyanoacrylate adhesive, which is a very fast um, adhesive. And then basically you push it on with a plastic foil and afterwards you pull off the foil, remove the foil and you're done. Uh, and this repair is very durable. Uh, luggage is moved over this uh, and the repair has to stay on for a long time. So to conclude, it's fast and easy to use, almost flush with the panel and durability was proven with a so-called roller cart test, which is a roller cart loaded with weights that, uh, that rides over the repair area to see if it's durable. Uh, Goldstream, um, a business leader on business jets, has many aircraft where the, the cabin is, and also the cargo and the cockpit compartments have thermoplastic carbon fiber reinforced floors. And also here, repairability was an important uh, criteria for choosing a concept, a product. So easy repairability was a, a requirement and uh, the patch repair kit meets this requirement. Uh, however, the kit to date has not been needed for this aircraft. Uh, Spike Heels is a design driver. Uh, so that's, that's what's relevant for this aircraft. The Gulfstream aircraft also have very uh, highly loaded floors in the middle of the aircraft, which covers the, uh, the hole in the fuselage above the wing. And uh, these floors are a bit uh, thicker. They are bonded together with a primary structure adhesive and they are primary structures, so they may not, they may not fail. It's a T300 uh, Torre fiber with polyethylamide. They include press formed edges, profiles that are bonded into the panel and it's a, a bonded primary structure. So what was done is to carry out a test plan for structural repair with epoxy adhesive. So in principle, it's, it's possible to repair these panels in a structural manner with a bonding methodology. And the reason that's possible is that the polymer, the PEI polymer, the Ultim is amorphous. So it has truly excellent bonding characteristics. Um, the program was in the end not, not executed, not necessary, because there has been very limited damage to these panels. Then a non-structural repair for glass PPS and carbon PPS products. Uh, so this is a polymer which has excellent chemical resistance, but is a bit more uh, or quite a bit more difficult to bond to. Uh, we do weld these materials. That's a different story. That's excellent, but bonding is difficult. However, for cosmetic repairs, there is a need for a simple repair method instead of having to replace the whole part. So what was developed is a wet layup method and it's used for small uh, damages such as corners uh, which are missing or damages to, a, to the surface like the metal mesh, the lightning strike mesh, which is included on these parts. And these are rudders, elevators for aircraft, but also wing leading edges of large passenger aircraft. An example in case is the A380 wing, uh, which has 16 uh, three and a half meter products, uh, assembled welded structures. And they have a um, aluminum mesh on the outer layer, which is for lightning strike protection and static electricity conduction. So there is a structural, uh, sorry, a non-structural repair method. An example here is a skin which has a scratch. So a scratch which has been uh, obtained by accident of the lightning strike material. So the way to do it is to cut out a mesh for the repair. Uh, so this is aluminum mesh. Then to sand the area to be repaired, to clean the area to be repaired. Then apply a layer of epoxy resin on the area to be repaired. Place the mesh and use a spatula to basically force out the excess resin, the excess uh, epoxy resin. 
and then make a, a vacuum bag to get pressure on the repair. And, and this is a thing which, which is important that we often need a bit of pressure or some form of maintaining form and shape of the product. Uh, so if we're thinking thermoplastic repair with, with welding or melting, then it becomes even more important. So here we have the vacuum um, application. So put vacuum on the whole thing, uh, a small coal plate and basically use the uh, uh, cure the resin. So a spatula once again to force out as much epoxy as possible uh, to keep the weight to a minimum and the thickness to a minimum. Then you cure with a heating blanket or without and then you're done. Um, if it's a metal mesh repair, it's important that there is electrical conductivity. So there's measurements to be done. Uh, for example, this is the NDT inspection, but also we have to measure the electrical uh, conductivity. So what you do with some light sanding is to lay bare the aluminum mesh on the patch that's repair and on the product itself. And then with two uh, electrodes to measure see that we have contact, electrical contact between these two. So these are cosmetic repairs done with epoxy resin, can be done in the field anywhere in the world, no particular equipment necessary. Another type of repair is, to, is the welding process. So these products consist of parts that are welded together as a big assembly. And uh, certainly in the beginning with new technology, sometimes the technology is not 100% robust. For example, a weld is not correct. And then it would be very nice if you could repair this weld instead of having to replace the whole product. And the incidental shop floor repair for this welding of a rib or a stiffening element is, uh, and this happened several times when there was an aborted uh, process. And what was done is to put a new rib at the same position and basically to restart the welding process. And because it's a, a thermoplastic, you can basically do a process several times, two times or even three times or four times without uh, running out of process time. The rib uh, flanges on this wing leading edge are sized not so much for the welding performance, uh, that would require only a few millimeters of width, but they are sized a little bit bigger, like 18 millimeters, so they can accommodate a fastener, a mechanical fastener, a rivet or a bolt, if that's necessary to repair. So the designers had in mind that this product should be repairable with conventional methods if necessary. A structural bolted patch repair, not so elegant, but very strong. Here is a picture of a wing leading edge uh, of an Airbus A380, a large aircraft, which was damaged. Uh, I think it's a bird strike and it was repaired with a bolted patch repair. So basically you cut out the damage area. Uh, so it's like going to the dentist uh, when you have a cavity in your tooth, uh, you cut out the damage area and lay bare a large portion to be repaired. Then repair sections are prepared. On the left, the green ones are aluminum. So that's roll formed aluminum sheet in primer on the right is uh, thermoplastic pieces that will be on the on the outside visible lots of holes it's not beautiful but it's strong and this is all put in place so first you put the aluminum structure on the inside and then the thermoplastic structure is put on the outside uh, so very simple using drawings and uh, and uh, copying whole patterns to to make it all work so it can be done anywhere in the world with very simple equipment Another repair is at the top of the of the wing leading edge. So the top skin was damaged. I think there was something stuck between the slat which they moved and the wing itself. So uh, once again, uh, uh, an opening was cut, a rectangular opening, to increase the size of the of the repair area. And then holes were drilled on the inside of the product. The welded structures were actually removed. So the gray lines that you see on the slide here, this was a welded uh, stiffening element. It's removed just for the repair. We have new stiffening elements, which will not be welded in this case, but just bolted into place with lots of bolts. And there is the bolting. So here the repair has been done. And this is the way it looks on the outside. So it's, uh, it's not very um, 
very elegant, but it's very functional and it's uh, certified and works very well and it's simple and can be done anywhere in the, in the world. Wing panels uh, in thermoplastics are also used on this Airbus aircraft. Non-structural repairs uh, I have shown you with the, the epoxy polymer and for structural repairs also here, bolted patch repairs, but for this type of small product, replacement seems more logical. Uh, an effort was started to see, could we repair these thermoplastic skins uh, with a real thermoplastic process? Uh, so no longer bolting, but melting something into the skin. And um, the way we did it was to remove some of the skin, uh, let's say the damaged area of the skin very carefully, and then to create a heating element that can follow the shape, the contour of the wing skin, and then basically melt a patch onto the skin. Now, the, the, the issue and the challenge is that when you do that, when you melt a thermoplastic product, it basically softens completely. So you lose the, the shape of the product and you have to support it on the backside. Uh, so, not, so you have the heating side, but the other side, you will need some kind of support or a vacuum with some kind of tooling. So we got very good quality but the uh, yeah the challenge was how do we do the pressure application and and in a factory on a shop floor you can do it but in the field when the aircraft is standing there that's much more complex so in the end for the wing leading edges we didn't really need this anymore the skin process the manufacturing process was very robust so there was no uh no need for a repair method in the factory however uh, repairing in the field today is still a bolted patch repair. Uh, this type of repair with heat and melting would be very elegant, but we have not solved the, yeah, let's say the challenge of how to hold the shape when it's melting. Control surfaces are thermoplastic these days as well. An example is the Goldstream 650. There are several aircraft with thermoplastic control surfaces, so rudders and elevators. And there are four to six meters in size, so quite large monolithic products with ribs inside. And they're actually built because of weight reduction and cost reduction. So they're quite cost effective and more lightweight than the sandwich based products, which they uh, replace. And when we weld ribs to the skin, you do not really see any weld line. So it's a very, very strong joint to, uh, to assemble these parts. Um, yeah, so the business case is about all about weight reduction and about cost reduction. And at the same time, it's important to be able to, to service these parts in the field uh, when they're in use. So the, pro the products consist of three uh, components, types of components. First of all, stamp formed ribs in large quantities. They are not so large, up to one meter in size. Then we have the skins and the spars. Those are much bigger. They're up to six meters in size. And today they are autoclaved, but in the future they will be manufactured out of autoclave. And the skin uh, um, is of interest because there is a provision in the skin design for repair. And the skin itself can be very thin, less than one millimeter in thickness. And it is very thin for the most part. But uh, on the picture, you see here kind of a discoloration. And this is the area where a rib will be welded in place. Uh, but what you see has nothing to do with the welding itself, but it is a, an increased thickness of the skin so that if it is necessary to do a repair in the field in the future, you have a bit more thickness so you can accommodate the bolt that has to go in there. And the bolt is uh, a countersunk bolt. So it has a V shape. It uh, creates a smooth aerodynamic outside surface. So it, it needs some thickness to, uh, to hold onto the composite material. So um, looking towards the future, there is a trend that uh, there are quite some uh, products in production, certainly with us that are fabric based still today. Um, there is the trend to go to unidirectional tape more and more with automated technologies such as fiber placement and very innovative designs. And the question is, how about repairing these UD structures? And uh, Julietta already showed some examples of how you can do it. Okay. Uh, in the Netherlands, the Dutch Aerospace, uh, National Dutch Aerospace uh, in, uh, Center has done some 
repair research on unidirectional tape laminates with uh, severe impact, local impact damages. And the research showed that with a proper heater and some call plates, it is very well possible to basically remelt the material and to fuse together the fibers uh, to, a, to a large degree. However, the challenge is to, to support the thermoplastic laminate while it is in the molten state. Uh, on the picture here is a laboratory setup where you see a, a, a tool, a flat tool, and there's some bagging and there's a heating system. So in a laboratory, it's relatively easy to create a tool that will support your, uh, your laminate, your product, and then you melt it and you fuse it together. The question is, how do you do that with a rudder or some other product in the field and you're melting your polymer and you have to keep it in place? The TPRC in the Netherlands, Anthem Plastic Research Center, has also uh, started doing research, uh, collaborative research on, uh, on repair. This is the FICS product, uh, project and there is a subsequent uh, project uh, continuing after this. In this project, the principle of thermoplastic research, much like all already initiated before that by the NLR, was research for small damages to reconsolidate the laminates. Also here, and that was based on vacuum, by the way. Also here, the conclusion was the, the difficulty and the challenge is to get uh, pressure on the, on the product during the melting phase. Uh, this was done with, uh, with scarf repair, so creating a scarf that fits nicely into the da damage area. And a similar work was also done extensively uh, recently by the Fiber Institute in Bremen and the Laser Center uh, Hanover. And it's also published in Composites World in together with uh, Airbus Operations and Lufthansa Technik to see if you can uh, create, um, let's say, um, a repair area to be repaired with, a, with a, an exact geometry. So a recess in the product that you will put a patch and the patch is specifically designed and made to fit exactly into the recess. And then using welding, you will put the patch in position. So here's some pictures from that uh, research. So first of all, there's an optical system uh, detecting the damage itself. The damaged material is removed with a, uh, an accurate robot. The repair area is measured and that's used to fabricate a repair patch. Uh, and that's a, a 3D uh, made a repair patch. And that repair patch is then subsequently laser welded into the damaged area. Now this research, a first research project has been concluded and there's a second one ongoing to further, uh, to achieve further results, but there's still work to be done. Um, and I'd like to give a bit of an outlook on, on thermoplastic products. So uh, there's a lot of history on thermoplastics, a lot of work being done. Today, the opportunity is really large structures like the complete fuselage of airliners, tails of aircraft, etc. And these are business jets, airliners, but of course we also have urban air mobility coming into the picture. Here a picture of the A350 being done, a very elegant structure in Laupheim in southern Germany. Uh, however, keep in mind there are many uh, bolts uh, to attach the frames to the fuselage skins, so it's a, it's a potential application area for thermoplastics. And if this fuselage were to become thermoplastic, then repair of such thin-walled carbon fuselage structure becomes a requirement. And uh, thermoplastic fuselage has been extensively researched or is being extensively researched in Clean Sky 2, the European uh, multifunctional fuselage project with a bottom half and a top half, which will be welded together in Germany uh, later this year. And for fuselage, the challenge in particular is that it is a very thin structure. It's less than two millimeters in certain areas. And there are all sorts of damages that can occur like lightning, hail, bird strike, uh, accidental impacts. So there's a good opportunity here for tough materials with robust designs and also repair procedures to go with this. And a final note is on urban air mobility. And you've probably all heard about this. Uh, several manufacturers and they all say that they will be manufacturing large amounts of vehicles in the future, thousands and thousands of vehicles. Uh, it's electric powered, vertical takeoff and landing. So weight is incredibly important. So the structures are very, very 
uh, advanced. Um, and, uh, and there will be a lot of these flying uh, and a lot of composites, thermoplastic composites, uh, because of the build rates and the weight requirements, thermoplastics will probably be applied here extensively. So also a large need of composite repair over here. So to conclude my presentation, and yeah, I'm sorry I haven't been able to, to give you the solution to repair thermoplastics in a truly thermoplastic manner have I fully melting the polymer but that is that is the end goal uh, but we're not there yet so there are several repair methods available today for thermoplastics and there is certainly a trend towards monolithic structures as a design concept uh, bolted patch repairs are becoming more common but they are not uh, so elegant so development of repair technologies using the high temperature melt process it is advancing but it needs more work so it's basically an invitation to collaborate uh, to achieve this goal. And finally, there's a strong growth and large potential for thermoplastics, uh, which makes innovative improved repair methods really relevant. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Arndt. Uh, really great uh, overview there. Um, as we mentioned, the, um, uh, the presenters and the, the SAMPI team are available to stay on a little over the 10 o'clock, uh, well, 10 o'clock on the West Coast here, uh, time uh, that this was scheduled to run for. I realize some people may need to leave, uh, but we will go into uh, some, some questions that have come in. Um, uh, first of all, uh, for Julieta, you showed some work towards the end of your presentation with the, uh, the PIPI peak, peak and PI peak. So one question was about the, um, the pressures that we used uh, for that, for the consolidation. Yes, so the pressure was the same. So in one of my slides, I showed that we applied a force of 30 newtons, so whatever that force uh, divided by the area, which was a 25 millimeter um, diameter um, uh, plate. And this was uh, dictated by the limits of the machine, the limits of the rheometer. We couldn't apply more than those 30 newtons, but it was enough to keep the specimens under intimate contact. All right, great, thanks. I know there's a question um, regarding your published work. Um, I don't know if you have you uh, can you make your email uh, available maybe so folks could contact you directly. Yes, of course. I can I can write my my email uh, in the chat for everyone uh, uh, and I can send you the links to uh, all, all the work that I presented today has been published, except for the last one which has been submitted and I can I can share those publications. So I'll put my email in the chat. All right. Um, Maybe one for Aunt. Uh, I think it's probably more for Aunt. Um, have there been any studies of the uh, aging effects of sort of welded repairs or repairs on thermoplastics? Uh, you know, for, for vehicles, obviously, that continue in service after the repair. Yeah. Yeah. So thermoplastics, um, yeah, are not so susceptible to aging. Uh, but yeah, to be fair, bonded repairs and welded repairs have been done on fairly new structures. And for, let's say, structures that have many years in service, it's either bolted repair today or the, the cosmetic non-structural laminated repairs with an epoxy. Um, so you could argue perhaps that, for example, for PPS, there may be a little bit of degradation over time, but not much. Uh, that's a nice thing about thermoplastics that they... Uh, retain their properties over time for, for a very, very long time. Yeah. Right, great. Um, now is another one that's perhaps more for you on, uh, obviously you, do men you did mention uh, repair on um, lightning strike um, or surfaces that have lightning strike on them. So one mm -hmm. question is, um, can you actually do lightning strike repair uh, with uh, induction welding, uh, where obviously the uh, the lightning mesh would potentially interfere with the uh, the actual induction uh, heating process. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, so re real repair technologies with welding are are still not yet in the field. But maybe if if you have a a strong mesh there, even a copper mesh, uh, which is very conductive, perhaps 
for those up for those areas you would want to have a another type of welding technology like uh, Julieta showed a conduction welding or ultrasonics uh, and if you don't have a, a mesh then induction is much uh, much more attractive could be yes right. Mark, I was just gonna ask you mentioned something about remote repair is that typical nowadays that you know the process is certified do you see that happening commonplace what, what do you mean with remote repair, uh, Raj? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I think you had in mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, in the field. Yeah, yeah. yeah, sure. So so the pictures of the Airbus A380 wing meeting edge were done in, in the field with customers. Uh, and the way it works is that uh, there is a damage, a, a serious damage. And uh, these repairs are not standard. Uh, so a stress engineer has to look at it and then basically tailor make a repair procedure for that okay. particular damage. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. But that can be that can be done through uh, yeah just by uh, by email or something uh, and then prescribe the damage repair as long as it's it's you can execute the repair. Yeah. Um, one back to uh, Julieta's presentation. I, I think towards the beginning of your presentation, you, you made a comment that large repairs are bolted uh, typically instead of bonded. Um, I guess if you can expand on that, certainly the question I was asking about things like the impact of laminate thickness, aerodynamic um, kind of surface limitations, and, and again, whether it was lightning strike protection um and areas around fuel tanks as an example um are also big influences on uh, what type of repair method is used yeah that's right so in the slide where i show the two types were in the overall let's say in, in general if it's structural we because bonded repairs are by itself they're not certified they're uh, there's no um, uh, like a non-destructive inspection technique that is certified to detect, for example, kissing bonds. So there needs to be uh, bolted, like they, they are bonded and bolted, typically. <laughs> now, it, this is in the general um, context, let's say, but it will depend on the location as well. So that gets into the more specifics of mm. repair. All right. Um... I guess one question, uh, again, might be more for Arndt, but a um, question about the uh, kind of broader certification. What, what's necessary to evaluate welds in a way that uh, would help convince and prove that welded repairs can reliably certified for aircraft in the future? Um, is it kind of, do you think this is an industry-wide or more from the regulatory uh, bodies? Well, so, so the certification of welding as a technology itself has been a major step. Uh, so welding is used now for several aircraft with several welding techniques. And 20 years ago, there was nothing. Um, there was only bonding and bolting uh, and actually only bonding at high temperature. So I think we've been able to convince the authorities that welding is truly uh, a very dependable way of joining two elements together. And, uh, and we could expand this acceptance at the authorities with welding repairs. But the fact that we are welding primary structure that has been flying already for quite some years is, is very important and, and will make it easy to, to convince the authorities, I think. Um, yeah, I, I'm certainly not an expert on this, but I know there is a, um, I think it's a composites repair working group, I believe as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a little bit of involvement in that in the past, although it was mainly to do with, uh, I think, thermosets and um, using thermoset adhesives. But I don't know, do you have any knowledge of that, Aunt, and if it's addressing thermoplastics? No, no, but that may be a good avenue. Yeah. All right. Um, Again, maybe one for both of you, um, uh, surface preparation techniques uh, for um, uh, particularly bonded uh, repair. Um, what would you say is kind of some of the latest on uh, advanced surface prep techniques? Yeah, if I can start. So, so the bond repairs we allow today are non-structural. So, um, so it's a light sanding and, uh, and an alcohol uh, cleaning operation. I think if you're going to bond for primary structure, then the cleanliness of the surface is really, really critical. Um, and that's not easy to guarantee. 
so um, so yeah, then you have to have an absolute uh, absolutely clean surface. Yeah. yeah. And if I may add, uh, there are some techniques that are coming up or like they're having used already, such as molecular plasma, for example, so low energy plasma, low temperature, but they have not been used in the context of repair yet. Uh, this would require a lot more uh, research, I would say. So something that it has been already developed and defined, to my knowledge, there's 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 nothing yet. Mm. All right, thanks. Um, and again, this maybe is more, more one for art, but um, do you think there's any need for guidelines on the number of patches, uh, kind of per unit area that could be allowed? Yeah, that 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 would be that would be good, but. Because the amount of repairs is still fairly limited, it is done on a case by case uh, basis today. And like the wing knitting edge of the A380, there are a few repairs, but not a large amount. And that they are so, that the repairs themselves are so different that uh, that they have to be judged on a case by case business, uh, uh, case by case uh, method. Yeah. All right. Um, and one more question for both of you before we kind of wrap it up. Uh, moisture and humidity issues. I mean, we know thermoplastics don't take up much moisture, but obviously parts in the field do. So if you're going to repair them, um, do you need to address that? Uh, you know, would you need to dry parts out, as an example, beforehand? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. So drying a whole aircraft, of course, is not feasible in the field. Uh, perhaps if you take the part off the aircraft, it is. Uh, but even then, uh, so I guess uh, in contrast to, to the virgin parts in the factory, we would have to, uh, uh, to compensate for that with the allowables, uh, the allowable values of the materials. They'll be slightly lower than uh, with the dried materials when you are doing your process, your welding process, for example. Uh, I don't know, Julieta, what do you think? Yeah, so that's uh, that 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 is uh, something that can be done, and also in terms of, for example, protecting the repairs from moisture. That's another aspect. Um, we could uh, combine other methods, for example, sealing the repairs as well. Um, and as Arn said, if we're conducting a repair on the aircraft, we cannot try the entire aircraft. So we need to we need to decide if we can live with uh, the performance or the decrease in the performance that the, that, that presence of moisture is causing. So um, yeah. That's, that's what I would say. All right, maybe just a couple of final questions. One for Julieta. Uh, one question about have thermoplastic repairs uh, been looked at that would use uh, chopped carbon fibers uh, in, in the thermoplastic polymer as opposed to uh, continuous? So from what I've seen in, in that literature survey that I conducted, there hasn't been. At some point, there was a, a paper published using uh, kind of sections, let's say, but it was still in the direction of fiber. And there was like a pressure um, shoe almost. And it was just being, let's say, um, applying this, this, this part progressively um, in order to also conform to a, a large curvature part. Uh, overall, from what I've seen uh, up to the review that I did last summer, <clears throat> I didn't find anything. And to the research that I'm keeping up with, I haven't seen anything specifically with uh, chopped fibers, chopped carbon fiber mm -hmm. to date. But doesn't mm -hmm. mean that it cannot be done um, if they think of a patch um, being processed this way. As we have that flexibility to process the patch the way we want. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Okay, and there's a final one for Aunt. Uh, there's a question about the uh, the large composite assembly uh, kind of repair that you showed. Um, is that uh, considered an engineering design standard repair or a, a kind of unique uh, one-off kind of mishap? Yeah, if it if it's about the the one on the Airbus A380 wing leading edge, yeah, the big one with all the bolts, uh, that's a one-off. Uh, specifically uh, uh, determined for that damage. Mm. So there, there is no standard for that. Yeah. All right, thanks. Well, I realize we're a little after uh, kind of 10 minutes beyond. So I think uh, we need to wrap things up. I don't know, Raj, did you yeah. have any final? Yeah, Yeah. sure. David, Arn, Julieta, and Rocio, if you can put on your, your video. Thank you so much. And all our participants, uh, it seems like we really reached out to the globe and brought you in. So we hope you enjoyed uh, the webinar. And uh, the next one, it's if you can remember this, it's the last Thursday of the month. 
So the next one is the last Thursday of July, and it's going to be on uh, wind power sustainability and EO end of life blade reuse. So uh, we, we're going to really uh, look forward to seeing you folks again. And uh, I believe, Rocio, we're going to have some feedback for our participants. Anyway, yes, uh, yes oh. there will be a short survey that will um, come after you sign on, and we appreciate if you would complete that. Thank you so much, and I thank, uh, thank you again to all the panelists. Yeah, thank you. And folks, please uh, take a look at the State of the Technology Industry Report available on nasampi.org. Again, this is a new effort for SAMPI. Uh, the technical committees are just starting to grow. We really look forward to continued engagement. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank Evening. you. Yeah.